One of the ironies about hypertension and high blood pressure is that despite how many people suffer from it, most of us don't know that we're suffering from it. But there is some good news about hypertension, which is that it's easily diagnosed and treated, and modification of behavior and lifestyle would go a long way to controlling our hypertension and high blood pressure. And joining me today to help us all understand hypertension and high blood pressure and what we can do to help ourselves is Dr. Derek Plain. He's a cardiologist with Franciscan Physician Network, Indiana Heart Physicians. This is the Franciscan Health Doc Pod. I'm Scott Webb. So, Doctor, thanks so much for your time today. We're going to talk about all things hypertension. So, a uh, great topic, one that's probably relevant for many of us, unfortunately. So, let's start here. What exactly is hypertension and why is it bad for us? Hypertension is when your blood pressure or the force of the blood pushing against the walls of your blood vessels is consistently too high for too long. And the problem with that is it causes coronary artery disease, it causes and leads to stroke, it leads to chronic kidney disease, and it leads to a host of a myriad of chronic medical problems that the blood pressure itself is usually not the, the problem, it causes other problems in the circulatory system. Yeah, I see what you mean. And, and really, as we know, no good can come from having hypertension, especially untreated hypertension. Give us a sense of how many Americans actually suffer from hypertension. Well, well over 100 million Americans and upwards of 50%, some estimates believe that. So it's incredibly common and it's an incredibly difficult problem. Yeah, it is common. And uh, fortunately, there are medications and we have uh, health care providers and so on. And I think the biggest problem is right just getting people to be aware uh, that they have hypertension, to see their doctors, to be treated and so on. Also, uh, maybe just break down for us when we think about age, gender, who primarily has hypertension? Well, everybody has hypertension, but it increases with age, for sure. We know that about 10% of 20-year-olds uh, have hypertension. That goes up to about 25 to 30% of people in their 40s. But amazingly, it goes up to about 75% for people in their 80s. So it's incredibly common, but it definitely worsens with age. Yeah, we're going to come back to that about uh, the prevalence uh, or incidence of younger folks having hypertension, which I don't think used to be the case or maybe just wasn't diagnosed as readily or as easily as it is now. But before we get there, let's talk about women and hypertension, especially after menopause. So women after menopause actually have a higher incidence of hypertension than men do, which often goes unnoticed or undertreated for sure. Uh, upwards of 80% of women uh, in the postmenopausal state can have hypertension, which is a huge health dilemma. Yeah, it really is. And let's come back now. Let's talk about uh, trends or, or things that have been developing over you know, the recent past, whether it's in younger patients, uh, certain occupations, and so on. So we've noticed that with the obesity crisis in America, hypertension has worsened. And it certainly is affecting younger and younger Americans. And that is a big problem. As we see that happening, we see increasing obstructive sleep apnea, which is very highly correlated with hypertension. Those two patterns have emerged uh, quite clearly. Yeah, they definitely have. And I think one of the difficult things, you know, for us, just the lay people, patients, is that we don't really know what's normal, right, when it comes to blood pressure. Uh, so maybe have you go through that. AHA guidelines, what's normal in terms of blood pressure, what's not? And at what level uh, would you recommend people like say, okay, this is hypertension and we need to do something about it, basically? The American Heart Association defines normal blood pressure as less than 120 systolic blood pressure, the top number, and less than 80 diastolic pressure. And anything above that is considered elevated. Uh, stage 1 hypertension is considered 130 to 139 systolic uh, or 80 to 89 diastolic. And stage 2 hypertension, which is kind of what has been defined as regular hypertension in the past, is greater than 140 over 90. And certainly, if your blood pressure is over 140, over 90, we need to be thinking about medical therapy. And if it's between that, we certainly need to be thinking about sodium reduction, weight loss, and general health maintenance to try to get our blood pressure under better control. Yeah, we definitely do. And I know that uh, as much as we would like to, we cannot escape uh, genetics and family history. Is hypertension just behavior and lifestyle, or is there a genetic component as well? There is a genetic component. I cannot point to a gene or a gene locus that shows you who's going to have it or it can't be tested readily. But people tend to be the children of their parents, and they tend to have the same risk factors, obesity. They tend to have the same stress level. They tend to have certain 
characteristics of their parents, and unfortunately, it tends to run in families. It does. But it's a little bit more difficult uh, question to answer. There are very rare forms of genetic hypertension, but for the most part, genetic hypertension does run in families, um, but it's not genetic per se. Yeah, I get what you mean. And and it's hard to pinpoint exactly what in our family history, our genetics exactly, you know, would cause hypertension, but we know that it's a thing. And we also know, as I mentioned, behavior, lifestyle, uh, controllable, modifiable things. So let's talk about that. You mentioned obesity and the crisis we have in America, but also I'm sure smoking, diet, lack of exercise. There's a lot of factors, right? Absolutely. So I would say number one is the increase in in weight of the population has been a big issue. Smoking continues to be a problem, especially in the Midwest. That is definitely a leading cause of hypertension. Dietary indiscretion with uh, higher saturated fats and especially high sodium diets can lead to or worsen hypertension. And the general lack of exercise and, and overall just poor maintenance of health here in the Midwest has been a major issue that certainly contributes to hypertension. Yeah, it definitely does. And I hate to say this because I have a couple of cups of coffee every day, but I'm sure that caffeine on top of smoking is just, uh, you know, you're just really doubling down, right? It's just no good can come from excessive caffeine and smoking. We definitely know that caffeine intake can transiently increase your blood pressure. The good news is, though, I, I think that for people that are listening to this podcast is that it does raise your pressure, but over time, that actually mitigates, and it's not as quite as bad as before. I wouldn't recommend taking in caffeine right before you check your blood pressure because it will increase it, but overall, it's not going to be a major contributor. However, smoking is definitely a major contributor and definitely modifiable and should certainly be stopped to help prevent high blood pressure in the future. Yeah, that's uh, good advice. I made that mistake one time of uh, sipping on a cup of coffee on my way to see my primary, and they were alarmed at how high my blood pressure was. And I said, oh, well, maybe that was the cup of coffee I just drank on the way here. And they <laughs> they said, yeah, don't do that For again. For sure. Other things I've heard from my primary about uh, being cautious of and not doing as much or in more in moderation is when it comes to salt. Salt, blood pressure, not a good marriage there. So what advice do you have for folks? Uh, Because I know that we all like our foods to taste well. I mean, you see people and I do it myself. I'll I'll salt foods before I even taste them. So from an expert here, why should we uh, go easy on the salt, doctor? Well, we also know that salt intake increases your volume of water inside your blood vessels, which causes high blood pressure. And we know that the more salt you intake, the higher your blood pressure is going to be. It's a difficult thing to to wean from, but I think most Americans need to throw the salt shaker away. There's just too much sodium in our food already. And the American uh, College of Cardiology has recommended drastic reductions in the amount of sodium that most Americans take in, uh, upwards of maybe only a third of what they are currently taking. So it's certainly something that's going to be a long-term problem that we need to work on, but sodium definitely dries up blood pressure, and it is a major problem. Yeah, my wife will get mad at me because she'll be like, you don't even know how I prepared this or how much sodium is in the meal. Why are you salting? At least taste the food first, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so let's talk about stress, and I know this is a difficult one because stress points, pressure points for you know folks may be different, but in general, when we think about high blood pressure, hypertension, how does stress factor in? Stress can certainly cause transient hypertension and, and overall can lead to a chronic low-level hypertension as well. It is certainly something to try to strive for to reduce stress in our lives, the stress in our jobs, stress in our families. We know stress kills, and it's a chronic difficult problem to remove from our lives. But trying to just deal with stress with yoga, with exercise, with healthy habits is certainly going to be helpful. But definitely uh, stressful situations can drive up blood pressure quite dramatically, in fact. Yeah, they definitely can. And I think we all just probably need to work on that. As you say, yoga, whatever it might be, ways of keeping our stress levels down. A lot of good benefits, including maybe keeping our blood pressure down along the way. And let's talk then about uh, some things that you know, we think about medications, uh, more traditional ways of treating high blood pressure or hypertension. How do you get rolling? I- I'm actually on blood pressure medicine myself, and it was a process with my primary of you know starting with a, a low dosage and kind of working up till we found you know the sweet spot if you will. So I'm sure that's true of all primaries, but just in general, can you take us through that? What's the process of, uh, okay, you've been diagnosed with hypertension and now here's what we're going to do about it. Well, we typically look for people that have comorbid conditions, meaning that uh, you have high blood pressure and maybe you have something else. Maybe you have a fast heart rate or maybe you have an enlarged prostate. 
And we try to generally get you on a low-dose medication that affects more than one process. But ultimately, we typically need to pay patients on a diuretic, a thiazide diuretic such as hydrochlorothiazide or HCTZ. Many people on the listening panel will have heard that medication. That's typically what we recommend, first-line therapy, and then we build from there and we add on multiple medications until we can get your blood pressure down to a reasonable goal without using too much medication to cause too many side effects. That's kind of the overall overreaching goal. Yeah, it's always that balance, right? The right amount of medication to treat the thing, in this case, maybe hypertension, but also then limiting the side effects. And great that we have experts and doctors to help us sort through all this. We definitely don't want to do it ourselves. Uh, Doctor, really educational stuff today as we wrap up. What would be your you know, final takeaways? What do you want folks most to know about hypertension and high blood pressure? I wanted them to know that it's incredibly prevalent and that there are multiple therapies to treat this and that discussing it with their primary provider is going to be paramount to their overall health and preventing cardiac problems, stroke, uh, et cetera, in the future, and they really need to be open to treatment. Yeah, that's the great takeaway is that we need to be diagnosed. We need to be treated. That's why we have doctors and experts and medicine and all of that. So, doctor, thanks so much for your time today. You stay well. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And for more information, visit franciscanhealth.org slash heart care. And if you found this podcast helpful, please share it on your social channels and be sure to check out the full podcast library for additional topics of interest. This is the Franciscan Health Doc Pod. I'm Scott Webb. Stay well, and we'll talk again next time.